Well, good morning, everybody. And I trust you're well and enjoying being part of the best family in all the world. That's the family of God. A few weeks ago now, when I last spoke to the church on a Sunday morning, I mentioned the symbol on the coat of arms for the Isle of Man. You know that symbol, that three-legged motif? They call it the legs of man. Around the motif is the island's motto, which, translated from Latin, is whichever way you throw it, it will stand. I always think that's a great motto for a nation or for a person. Whatever way you throw me, I'm going to stand. It was the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians. Uh, he says there that there have been times when he'd been knocked down by life, but he was always able, with the help of God, to get back up again and move forward. Whichever way you threw him, he would stand. Like Pam said in her Facebook message a couple of weeks ago, he'd pick himself up, dust himself off and start all over again. Don't worry, I'm not going to start to sing. Sighs of relief. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, uh, 13, to put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes and those difficult and hard and problematic days do come, you will be able to stand. The purpose of the power of God's Spirit in our lives is to equip us for living in victory so that whatever life throws at us, we can stand. Disappointment and frustration, confusion, perplexity, all these things and many more come our way. But greater is he that is in us than anything the world can throw at us. So I pray that the God will find that same spirit in the members of this church. Whatever way you throw us, we will stand. One of the great things about the internet is, of course, its ability to enable us to discover easily information that previously would have taken a trip to the library or as owning a comprehensive set of encyclopedias. Like, for instance, my recent research uh, for a list of the mottos for all the countries in the world. That was an interesting and sometimes hilarious search. I commend it. It was fascinating to view the different nations or provinces of the world and the, de and the declarations that they made in their mottos. The province of Newfoundland in Canada have as their motto, Seek first the kingdom of God which I think is pretty unbeatable as a motto for any nation or for any person. I commend that one to you. Switzerland has as its motto, one for all and all for one. There's echoes of the swashbuckling three musketeers. The phrase was first used by the Protestant church back in the 17th century in Prague. I like that as a motto for it speaks to me of covenant faithfulness loyalty, brother to brother. And I love that. It's a great motto for the church, for the family of God, for a body of believers, one for all and all for one. Near a home here in the UK, Wales, of course, has Cumbrian Bith, meaning Wales forever. Scotland has no one provoked me with impunity, which in any language sounds like fighting talk. England doesn't have a motto, but a recent campaign to try to find one, uh, of all the suggestions put forward, my favourite was May Contain Nuts. <laughs> now there's a motto that we as a church could readily adopt. In the tiny landlocked country of Luxembourg, they have as their motto, we wish to remain what we are, which I hope none of us will ever take on as a personal mantra. Why? Because no matter how far we have come, there is always more in front of us. No matter, no matter how much we may have achieved, we, we don't want to stay as we are. You know, the slow death of every Christian movement or organisation begins when they stop journeying forward, when they somehow believe they have arrived, when they believe there's no more to discover 
No more changes necessary. No more development needs to be made. There's, there's no more revelation to come. There's no more light to be shed. We've got it all. Well, of course, the same applies to the individual Christian who ceases to be a pilgrim and becomes a settler, who is content to say, I want to stay as I am. There are those who are willing to sacrifice a call of God upon their lives on the altar of their own comfort and convenience. Those who by their very lives say, I'll go this far, but no further. Oh, they would never verbalise that sentiment. They would always be able to talk a good talk, say the right things. But their lifestyle carries a different narrative. And it's by our fruit that we are known. And sadly, the spirit within, within them <clears throat> declares we wish to remain what we are. I cannot commend the motto of Luxembourg to you as a personal mantra. <clears throat> Greek mythology tells us that Hercules constructed two pillars near the Straits of Gibraltar to mark the edge of the then known world. These pillars bore the warning Ne plus ultra, or no more beyond. They served as a warning to sailors and to navigators to go no farther, essentially shutting the door on possibility. In the 1400s, the belief that there was nothing more to discover was so prevalent that non plus ultra, or, or ne plus ultra, was written on the edges of their maps. It even became Spain's national motto, so that wherever the Spanish flag flew, it declared that there is no more beyond. Until one man acted on his conviction that there was in fact more beyond, and in so doing changed the world forever. In 1492 Columbus set sail into, the, into unknown waters and to unknown destinations. And upon discovering new lands and new opportunities, Spain dropped the non from its, min from its motto and minted coins with their new motto, plus ultra, more beyond. And today in the city of Valladolid in Spain, you will find a monument to Columbus. Its most interesting feature is a figure of a lion destroying the first of those three Latin words, leaving only the words plus ultra, more beyond, there's more beyond. The death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit of God changed everything. The lion of the tribe of Judah has torn down every barrier, has opened every door and has marked the dawn of a new age of possibility and discovery. Hallelujah. That does not mean we have to get into a ship and sail away searching for new lands, although a sea cruise is always nice, but there are new lands of possibilities within each, within each one of us waiting to be discovered. There is more beyond. In fact, if you want to give a denominational label to us as a people, it should be that we are possibilitarians. We believe that with God, all things are possible. We are indeed without borders because there's more beyond. The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians 3.13, I'm forgetting the past and I'm looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. And if you disagree on some point, I believe that God will make it plain to you. I really like the way that Paul expresses this. He says, we have to continue to press forward because that's the call of God upon our lives in Christ. And then he says, if you're spiritually mature, you'll agree. The inference, of course, being if you disagree, you're spiritually immature. He goes on to say, if you disagree with me, God will tell you differently. So press on and press forward. Why? Because there's more beyond. On the day of Pentecost, Peter, speaking to the crowd, quoted the prophet Joel. 
when he spoke about the days in which we are living. Acts 2.17 says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. You know, I'm not sure when old age begins. I always think it's 10 years older than me. Well, some people might disagree. But then I don't see myself as old. Moses was 80 before he even began his mission in life. I'm just a boy. When Joel prophesied about your old men dreaming dreams, it was not about them sitting back in a rocking chair thinking about the good old days or having an afternoon nap, although the afternoon nap does sometimes sound good. No, the dreams here are dreams that the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come is one of the significant mantras of my life. Whatever season of life I might be in, I want to live believing that the best is yet to come. You know, that's why I never enter competitions to win the holiday of a lifetime. Because I might win. And then having been on the best holiday I'm ever going to have, every future holiday will be conferred, compared negatively to the better one that has gone behind. I always want to live my life looking forward to better things that are coming. The dreams I'm dreaming are that the best is yet to come. I'm dreaming dreams of what God will yet do in and through me. I'm dreaming dreams of what God will do in the church. I'm dreaming dreams of reaching regions beyond. While many in the day of Columbus thought they had reached their fullest potential and had gone as far as they could go, there was no more beyond, Columbus pushed the limits even further. He opened new doors, new possibilities. Those are the kind of dreams I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming dreams of God, raising a new generation of young men and women full of the Holy Spirit who have been gripped by a vision to propel the kingdom forward with miracles and signs and wonders. My dream is that I will continue to run my race with them. And even when God takes me home, I will join with the heavenly throng who cheers them on and urges them forward. Those are the sort of dreams I'm dreaming. In these days of lockdown, social distancing, distancing of being restricted on where we can go, what we can do, with whom we can meet, there can be a danger that we press the pause button on our spiritual progress, that we write on the map of our pilgrimage, no more beyond. You know, in so many ways, and for so many people, lockdown is cosy and comfortable. It's time out from the usual busyness of life, a time we can relax and chill and take our foot as it were off the accelerator. But God in recent years has been pushing us out of the nest and even in these strange times that hasn't changed. I don't want to come out of this pandemic thinking phew I survived but that even with all these restrictions I made some progress. If nothing else I prepared myself for the more beyond lockdown. It's true that it may be some time before the church can meet together on a Sunday. But the good news is this, there's no lockdown on the Holy Spirit. That there's no social distancing between you and the throne of God. There are no restrictions on where your praying can take you. There is no limit set on what the anointing of God can accomplish through the man or woman of God who declares there is more beyond and the best is yet to come. During this time we have not been given permission by God to settle back and retire from kingdom advance, but only to press on to the end of the race and to receive the heavenly prize for which God has called us. In all the changing seasons of our lives, we may find that we live and operate and function in different ways than we did in previous times, but there is no season of life 
when we have permission to ease back on our passion and our zeal and our love for God. In the words of the American poet Robert Frost, we have promises to keep and miles to go before we sleep, miles to go before we sleep. God has been faithful to us in keeping his promises and we must be faithful in keeping our promises to him. There are many things in life that take us by surprise, many things we don't understand, but we know that God knows and that he has proven himself over and over and over again to be our faithful God. I'm confident all things will work themselves out for good and for kingdom advance. And we have to understand that our present situation is not our final destination, that there is more beyond, that the best is yet to come. Some journeys can be difficult. Many years ago, uh, we were on our honeymoon, that's 50 years next year, uh, Pam and I travelled to a little village in Scotland called Applecross. The 12 mile road to Applecross is the steepest road climb of any road in the UK. It's full of blind corners, herping bends, narrow lanes and very steep drops at the side of the road. I swear as I looked down I could see the top of the Sydney Opera House. But when we arrived in Applecross, that pretty little village nestled by the side of the beautiful lock, it made the difficult journey worthwhile. Difficult roads often lead to beautiful destinations. My friends, for the believer there is always more beyond, always new things to explore, new horizons to pursue, new skills to learn. Even speaking to you today by video rather than in person has required me to learn a new way of communicating. Some of you ladies have learnt the new skill of cutting your husband's hair, although uh, I don't know of any wives who have let their husbands loose on their hair with a pair of scissors. Maybe I'm wrong. I doubt it. Folks, don't press a button, the pause button on your spiritual growth. Don't fly a banner over your life declaring this far and no far further. There is new ground to take, new lands to be discovered, new things to learn. We are not pilgrims. We are, sorry, we are pilgrims. We are not settlers. And at the end of our lives, when we have finished our race, we can leave this world behind knowing that there is more beyond and that the best is yet to come. Then we will see him face to face. Then we will hear his words of welcome. Well done, good and faithful servant. Then we will realise fully that difficult journeys lead to beautiful destinations. I like the story of the elderly lady who loved her church family and in particular enjoyed those times of fellowship when they all ate together. When the main course was over and the dishes were being cleared, uh, just before the sweet course was served, somebody would call out, Hold on to your spoons, the best is yet to come. When this lady died, she arranged to be buried with a spoon in her hand because she was confident that the best was yet to come. Because for the believer, for those who have received Jesus as Lord and Saviour, there is always more beyond. For some, of course, the grave is the ultimate non plus ultra. For them, there is nothing beyond. Death is the absolute and permanent co conclusion of life, the shoreline be beyond which there is nothing else for them to look forward to. I really trust that is not the case for anyone listening today. But if you are listening and you would like to receive Jesus and Lord, as Lord and Saviour, then I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me now. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that you died on the cross to save me, to forgive me for my sins, to deliver me from them. I ask for your forgiveness, that you be my Lord and Saviour, and I hand over control of my life 
to you. Now I thank you you've heard my prayer and that as, a, as I prayed, believing and trusting in you, I am now your child. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us at the church office or through our website. Please let us know and we'll be here to help you as you move forward with God. And please also remember, everyone who's listening, there's more beyond and the best is yet to come. Amen. God bless you all.